The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church and grateful for any visitors who have come to worship our living God together. We welcome you and are glad you are with us. This morning we're going to partake of communion together. We'll come to the table and we're going to join our corporate and individual faith uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and just remembering what our blessed hope is. And so it should be a glorious morning. As a church, we're going to study through Peter's second epistle, if you'll turn there with me. <coughs> We've been working through this epistle for a little while now, and uh, we started chapter 2 last week. And we, we're going through right now a warning that Peter's given against false teachers. And he's talking about the dangers and then how to spot them and how not to come under their influence. And they, they're a great threat to the church of God, and they're hurting, obviously, this one that Peter is writing to. And we're to be, uh, the, the first chapter is to grow and gain assurance in conformity to Christ, and our entrance into the kingdom of heaven will be abundantly supplied for the true believers who hold to Christ and keep persevering and swimming to Christ's likeness all the way to the end. And these false teachers will come and start spreading a message that tells you you don't have to fight for godliness. You can just live any way you want. Nothing matters. And so these false teachers are spreading their wares in this church. As I've thought on this more, what is it that characterizes God and His throne? He tells us His throne is a throne of righteousness and justice. Hebrews tells us it's a throne of grace for the child of God to draw near. Psalm 89, 14, righteousness and justice are the foundation of thy throne. Isaiah 65, 16, because he who is blessed in the earth shall be blessed by the God of truth. And he who swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth because the former troubles are forgotten and because they are hidden from my sight. Again and again in scriptures, God reveals himself to be the God of truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. And so God cannot lie. John 17, 3, sanctify them. Thy word is truth. We saw in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 through 21, all scriptures are God-breathed. They've been inspired, and, and, and men uh, were moved by the Holy Spirit as they recorded them. So we, we studied and we looked and said, what we hold this morning is the word of God. And so the calling of the church is to teach this truth day in and day out, in season and out of season, to herald and proclaim it. God, sanctify them in the truth. The way we're going to grow and be conformed to the image of Christ is through the truth. And then I was thinking on the enemy who is the devil. He's the evil one. And in John 8, 44, Jesus says he's a liar and he's the father of all lies. They all spring forth from him. He's full of lies and deception. And he spreads it. The scriptures go on to tell us then that God hates a lying tongue. In Revelation 21, 8, the lake of fire is prepared, he says, for those who are liars. God cares about truth. He cares that his word is proclaimed in truth. He cares that we speak ourselves in truth. And so God is against those who lie, against the father of lies. They'll be cast down in the eternal fire. Thus, what we are studying, what God hates the most then, is if you teach a lie and declare it to be His truth. So if you're saying this is the truth of God and you're lying, He hates it. And this passage that we'll look at this morning is how will God deal with such liars? Let them have their applause now. Let them have their big stadiums. John says the world will listen to them. Let them preach on our context on greed and sex. But it will come to an end because God knows how to deal with these kind of teachers who lie and present it as God's truth. He knows how to deal with it. And Peter's going to become impassioned in this section in one long sentence that begins in verse 4 and goes to verse 9. He'll say, if, if, if God did this, then he knows how to do that. One commentator said it's just one long, white, hot, heated 
sentence. And that's what I chose for communion. No, it chose me. I just keep following through, okay? Someone said, what are you preaching on? I said, God knows how to judge false teachers. And then we're going to go to the communion table. <coughs> but I'm going to show you the glory and the beauty of where this will lead us this morning. Verse 1 of 2 Peter chapter 2, he says their destruction will be swift. And verse 3, their judgment, it's not idle or asleep. And now he's going to flush out this judgment in verses 4 through 10. Well, why? Well, false teachers have made their way into Peter's church. And in that area where he's writing to the circular letter. And they're telling the flock, it doesn't matter how you live. Same message in America today. It doesn't really matter how you live. Grace covers over all of these sins that he will be dealing with. Uh, have at it. Live any way you want. We're all under grace. Because later they, they teach that Christ in chapter 3 isn't coming back. He's not going to return. He's not coming back in judgment of sin. And they did not believe in a God then who would punish sin. And I dare say, much like our day and age. And then it's just, he's become a scarecrow. And, and God is one who is not feared for his justice and reverence. And, and there is just a mindset of antinomianism that I can just live any way I want and God doesn't care. And I'm fighting you for that week in and week out in this section that no one in this place would believe that. So Peter is using judgment in this chapter, and I want you to hear this, as a motivation to turn away from sin and ungodliness. Okay, chapter one, what did we learn? What did we learn? The, the highest motivation for Christian obedience is koinonia with God in verse four. That you can have fellowship with God through this gospel. You can be brought back into union and communion with God. And that overcomes these lusts of the world. You get full assurance and eternal life. That's the greatest motivation you will ever find for overcoming sin. But is it the only motivation that God uses? You're going to see He throws so many different kind of motivations for us to be a holy people. One, His, his soon return. This morning, there's going to be judgment. And God will use a lot of different things in motivating and driving and showing us, I want to pursue after Christ to the very end. In chapter 2, they're falling into this kind of thinking and living. And there's a judgment that comes for the one who takes it in and teaches it and follows it and even destroys himself. So it's a wake-up call to the society that we live in, a lot of the teaching that's going on around us. And to ask yourself this morning, have I been numb to it? Have I drifted into this? Uh, this, is, this is a warning. Wake up. Okay, that there's glories and beauties that come in chapter 1. In chapter 2, you go down this there's a God who knows how to bring judgment upon this iniquity. And so there are many warnings uh, in the Bible. And, and there's a dreadful day of judgment coming upon the ungodly at the end of the ages. And the false teachers are going to try to remove it. And they're going to make you, you don't think about that. That isn't in the Bible. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. And so they're going to they're keep finding ways to get that out of the conscience. And so the driving question of this section is, does it really matter how I live? Go back to chapter 1, verse 5 through 7, <clears throat> where we're making all this diligence in light of the gospel of, that we've been justified and made right with God. And now there's a diligence to the Christian's life, not out of legalism, but out of acceptance and love. And now we're laboring and stroking to, to have this Godliness he talked about and moral excellence and, and Philadelphos and agape and all of these areas that we are seeking to grow in. Does it really matter? And verse 9 of chapter 2 is the summary this morning. It says that the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. And so he says, God knows how to judge the ungodly. And he knows how to rescue the godly from a perverted generation. So he knows if you're sitting here in the battle every day, the world trying to conform you, friends trying to squeeze you, he's saying God knows how to rescue the righteous from all of this generation and all the pressures. He knows how to get you out of it. But he also knows how to bring judgment upon the ungodly. And that's where he's moving this whole argument. 
And so that's where I would like to move this this morning. And so what I would like to do is to go before the throne of grace, ask God to meet us and come teach us. Father, we come before you. And I pray, Lord, that every word is inspired by you. That's profitable for teaching and correcting and reproof and training in righteousness. I pray, Lord, now, uh, I have no idea how you want to use this passage in every heart, but you do. And so I pray that you would take these little loaves and fishes and you would multiply it now, this word, into every mind and heart. And you would come and do your surgery and comfort and, and even cause fear in the hearts that need it. God, you know exactly what every heart needs. So by your Holy Spirit, would you now take this word and work specifically and personal in every heart here this morning. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our outline this morning is we're going to look, it's, it's a pretty simple outline as we're going to flow through verses 4 through 10, is the first is going to give us three examples of God punishing the unrighteous, and then he's going to give us two examples of God delivering the righteous, knowing how to do both. So let's take up our first point, three examples of God punishing the unrighteous, and again, the context is the immorality of the day and what is going on in this section. And he's going to now grab three examples, and they all come from the book of Genesis. And so the first one I want to look at in verse 4 are the angels that sin. Verse 4, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. So for, at the beginning, would be better translated since. It's a, it's a condition of reality, since. It's already been done. The judgment has already happened. This is a historical fact. So how does God deal with this kind of perversion and sin that these teachers are teaching and the people are starting to take up in their society and even in some of the churches? And so how, how do we deal, uh, how will God deal with that kind of behavior? And there's just a simple principle that Peter is bringing forward is that God judged it in the past and He will judge it again in the future. The pattern has been set by God. So what is this talking about, this verse that these angels sin? You might be saying, I've never heard that before. And one thought from commentators they began is maybe it's pre-creation. Before God created and a third of the angels sinned and they were cast down out of heaven. And my problem with that is they're still roaming the earth and wreaking havoc today. So that isn't it. They're not in prisons of chains or we wouldn't even need to meet this morning. So let's try and unfold this and not take the whole morning to do it. Amen. Some of you love this kind of stuff and you wish I'd spend a week, you know, maybe a month on it, but I'm not going to. Okay? I want to stay in the flow and not get lost in this verse. But let's understand it at least. So it says that he cast them into hell and he committed them to pits of darkness. And so in the Greek, he got the word Gehenna, which was the valley dump of Jerusalem, and it would be lit perpetually to burn the trash. And that was the word that Jesus chose to speak of this eternal fire that would come uh, called hell. And so... Uh, uh, that's not the word that Peter chose here. He chose the word tartarosis, and it's where we get the term tartarus. It's kind of a, a holding place until judgment. The unrighteous were sent there when they died, and now they're there awaiting the eternal punishment that will come at the end of the age. And so it appears from our text, we have angels here, which would have to be fallen angels then in these pits, and they're waiting a final judgment. So fallen angels in Tartarus waiting for this eternal punishment to go into the lake of fire. So my question is, what did these demons do to deserve this condemnation? <laughs> uh, they do bad stuff every day, wouldn't you think? Like, what does a demon do to get in big trouble? <laughs> to get sent to the principal's office? What, what did they do? What, what could they have done that God would take them and throw them in this place, this prison, early before the great white throne, the great judgment when they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire? So what it tells us, come back to verse 4. He says, when they sinned. So there's something they did that was sin, that was such a nature that God sent them into the pit early. 
And so do we have anything in Scripture that might help us know what this is? Anything jumping out in your minds? If you're in Nate's Bible study, I hope something's jumping out because he just taught on it this week. If, if you're not remembering it, you should join a new community group because it should be <laughs> sticking in your brain at least. So do we have anything that might help us? Because Peter and Jude are, are going to talk about the same thing and they never really give us an exact specific of what it is. But they bring it up like anyone who reads this in their day and age would know exactly what they're talking about. They just drop it and assume you know the event. And so that jumps out that, that we got to figure out what that is and it should be something obvious and not something under a rock. And so all the commentators that I have and read, they all agree that it's coming from Genesis chapter 6. And I'm going to read it for you if you want to turn to it, or if you just want to hear it. <coughs> it's verses 1 through 5. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever, whomever, whomever they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, the men of renown, those eight-foot, nine-foot giants when they go into the promised land. And then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually." So the question then is, what are these sons of God? And there's some thoughts that maybe they were little divine beings. Uh, royal princes actually sometimes had that phraseology. But the, the angels, Job calls them the sons of God. And so almost everyone that I was reading, again, is leaning towards the, the angels, and I think there's good reason for it. It's not uncommon for the angels then to come to earth in human form. We see it again and again. There were the three visitors who came to Abraham and Sarah and they had on human bodies. We're going to read this morning about Sodom and Gomorrah and we will see the same thing with angels. And in Hebrews it says, you know, show hospitality to strangers. You'd never know if you're entertaining angels, unawares, which means you might have humans sitting in there having food and they're really angels. So they, they can take on human bodies. So get this, they don't always show up with halos and wings. Angels can come in human form. And here in Genesis 6, they come and they have union with the daughters of men. And so what happens now is they cross species lines and there are many views to why the de demons did this. And they're all speculation and, it, and I, I just am going to go with, it's just enough to know that they did it. They crossed a line that was unacceptable. Uh, it, they're going to be tossed into Tartarus because of what they did. And this interpretation and account in studying this week, this was Jewish tradition. It was how they understood Genesis 6 in that day. And first, Enoch, the Jubilees, Josephus, Damascus writings, they all say that the angels did this and bore great giants called the Nephilim. And so it's, it was common, that's how they thought of what took place in Genesis 6. And then this would also fit Peter's flow. He's moving from Genesis chronologically as he's talking about judgment, and so he starts with Genesis 6, the angels, and then Noah, and then Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's just a nice contextual flow. And so my conclusion here on verse 4 is that the angels came and had union with the women, and God toss them into Tartarus until that final judgment where they will be cast into the eternal lake that burns with fire. And the angels know this. When Jesus comes on the scene in Matthew 8, they cry out, Don't, have you come to torture us before the appointed time? You know, are you going to throw us into Tartarus? And then in Jude 1, which is almost identical to 2 Peter 2, it says the angels did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, these, these places they shouldn't cross. And he's kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day, Tartarus. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, 
since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh. And they're exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. And Jude's almost tying it in exactly the same way and filling in a few thoughts. So what is the point? Why do you bring something like this up, Peter? God didn't spare the angelic beings. They spread corruption and sinful deviation. And then will, will he spare the liars of the truth who, restore, who destroy his redemptive purposes and bring about this gross immorality that's going on in, in, the, in the cities right now? And it's saying he's not going to spare it. He didn't spare angels. And he's not going to spare those who do the exact same taking and twisting of the scriptures and perversions. Second, well, look at our second point in verse 5. <clears throat> he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So I want you to consider the ancient world. I just read it in Genesis 6, 5. He, he saw that every intent of the thought was only evil continually. Just the corruption that has spread to the whole earth. The world is evil, and God is going to judge it, and he's going to judge it by way of a flood. And, and I just want you to get this. I know some of you, my kids kind of grew up with this little ark that floated in the bathtub. And you had toys and animals, and it was just one of the best toys in the bathtub ever, and it was just a cute little story and playtime, but that is not what that ark was. The ark was the fury and judgment of God upon a world of un unrighteousness, and you, you, we can't lose who God is in our day and age that won't talk this way. There is a God who looked out at that earth, and it was only evil continually, and he is going to bring a flood of judgment and destruction upon the earth. There's never been a judgment like it in the history of the world when God flooded the whole earth and drowned all of its inhabitants except eight. And the exception will be how we close this sermon at the cross. But the final judgment that is coming is going to be fire and brimstone, which is where all false teachers and those who will follow their teachings are moving. So the, the argument again is if God didn't spare the whole, the whole world, He judged every one of them in a flood, why would He spare a lesser number of these false teachers who are infiltrating the church and spreading the same kind of corruption? Third one, look with me in verse 6. And if He condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes having made them an example to those who had lived ungodly lives thereafter, to make them an example so those who live ungodly will realize that God knows how to punish the wicked. And so this was the two major cities <coughs> of the plain. And they, they were called the, the cities of the valley, Sodom and Gomorrah. And God condemns the whole city. And in our verse, it says it took those two cities and reduced them to ashes. All that's left of these two cities is ashes because of judgment and fire that came. The city was so devastated that you can't even find those cities now. They have done digs and all around there and they can find all the other cities in that region and these two are just gone. Can find nothing of Sodom and Gomorrah. No existence. Ashes. Finished. So what happened on Genesis 19, uh, or uh, Genesis 18, uh, God tells Ab he, Abraham that he's going to judge those cities, and Abraham and him have this back and forth. You remember it well, I'm sure. But he, Abraham's like, you can't destroy it. What if there's 50 righteous people in that city? Then, I, then I'll spare it. Well, what if there's 40? And they, they keep going down, 20 and 10, and there's not even 10 righteous people in the whole city, and this, this isn't long after the flood. And then we see in Genesis 19, let's read it. No, we got, yeah, let's read it. <laughs> it ties in so clearly to what Peter's teaching us by the Spirit of God that I just want to kind of journey Sodom and Gomorrah this morning. Verse 1 of chapter 19. 
Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. And he said, Now behold, my lords, please turn aside into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you can rise early and go on your way. They said, however, no, but we shall spend the night in the square. And Lot knows you don't want to spend the night in that square. But so he urged them strongly. And so they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he prepared a feast for them and baked unleavened bread and they ate. And before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, don't act wickedly. Now behold, I have two daughters who have not had relations with man. Please, please let me bring them out to you and do to them whatever you like. Only do nothing to these men inasmuch as they have come under the shelter of my roof. And that statement has bothered me my whole life. So go to Nate's community group. He's going to hit Genesis 19 at some point. And I'd like to hear what he says on that. But I can weasel out and leave it to him. But they said, stand aside. Furthermore, they said, this one came in as an alien and already is acting like a judge. Now we will treat you worse than them, Lot. So they pressed hard against Lot and came near to break the door. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door and they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great. So now they wearied themselves trying to find the doorway. They're, they're, they're wearying themselves in their debauchery and sin and what is going on, even with being stricken with blindness. And as it continues then, the, the, the uh, fire and brimstone will come upon and Lot and his family will flee out and his wife will look back when the angel said don't and she turns into a pillar of salt and God brings judgment upon this whole twisted, perverted, broken Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> God incinerates the entire city and we're told that they're an example of those who would live ungodly lives thereafter. So it, it's to, to wake us up and to just say, I'm not going to go down this culture and this path that my country's wanting us to go in. I, I'm not going there. And I'm going to keep going to the glories and the beauties of Christ and what I'm finding in Koinia with Him and, and the mercies and the excellencies of Christ. I'm not going down that. So God knows how to judge those who are sinful and evil and wicked. He judged the angels who left their domain. He judged the world in the days of Noah. And He judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And now our second point to our outline is in verse 9 as well, that God knows how to rescue the righteous. So he, he does know how to deal with this kind of corruption and sin. And sometimes you can look out and say, is this ever going to end? Is, why is God ignoring it? it? God's patience is His power holding back when He's going to release His judge, justice. And, and so that it's like He knows how to judge it, and He will at the right time. But the good news is He knows how to deliver the righteous from the midst of all of this perversion and twistedness that we live in, if you'll remember back to chapter 1, verse 4, that we escape the corruption that is in the world by lust. All the corruption and all the epithemias and over-desires that we live in, He knows how to bring us out and rescue us from it. And so let's look at it in verse 5. He tells us first that he, he rescued. He did not spare the ancient world, but what did he do? He preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, his family, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And, and we, he tells us he was a preacher of righteousness. And so Noah's preaching righteousness, and it takes him 120 years to build an ark. And I guarantee you, he got lots of questions. People are like, what are you doing? And he's saying, judgment is coming upon the unrighteous. I'm, I'm building an ark for deliverance. Repent. And they're mocking him and ridiculing and making fun of him. And then one day, judgment comes. 
and it comes mightily and it comes swiftly. The whole earth is flooded, but Noah and his little family are on the ark and they are delivered safely from the judgment of God that came that day. God knows how to deliver the righteous from the judgment when it comes. They stood against a sinful culture. They preached righteousness. They did not give in to the day of the false teachers that were saying, all is well. There's never been a flood. <laughs> never. A lot of people believe never in the history of the world. There's never been a flood. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, is what we heard they were doing when the judgment came. And they're just continuing on. This is what life's about. Forget about this judgment stuff. I just want to enjoy life and have all the pleasures, and I don't want to die until I get as many as I can. That's all this garbage that's going on in the day. And there's a preacher of righteousness. They held on to God, and they held on to righteousness in the middle of all that. And the reward, they were delivered safely from the judgment of God. And so I pray for this weary church in my own soul that the same will be for those who hold on to Christ and don't get swept up in this immoral and godless generation. Don't get swept up in it. And if you're sitting here this morning getting swept up into it, I hope that God has given you this message to say stop. Repent. Repent. They're teaching in ways that are all around us. Hold on to Christ. Believe. Commune and swim to Christ-likeness. Does God know how to deliver you? He says in verse 11 of chapter 1, in this way the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. He knows how to deliver the righteous. And let's look at our other example then. He tells us about Lot. In verse 7, if he rescued righteous Lot, Pressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. For by what he saw and heard, that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. There's a, there, is there a righteous family in Sodom? Verse 7 says, Lot was a righteous man. Oh, really? <laughs> Abraham, let's divide the land. Lot, pick whatever you want. Well, I'll take the nice, green, lush part. After the, after the judgment, he gets drunk and immoral with his daughters. He offers his daughters to a perverted bunch to spare the visitors. And I don't know if, what he was thinking, and it could, there could be some righteousness in it and some unrighteousness. I, I don't know. But Abraham says, God, would you spare the city if there's ten? Yes. But I will deliver everyone in that city who is righteous. And we're told that Lot was righteous. Abraham believed God earlier in Genesis and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And I'm sure he's now shared this gospel, this truth. I can't guarantee it, but I know that Lot somehow has believed the gospel. He's believed what God said he would do. And it says he is now righteous. Verse 7. He's a righteous man. It says he's oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. And in verse 8, he felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. I can't tell you how much that jumped out at me. Lot's called righteous. <laughs> we already see in our context, he is not a perfect man. <laughs> Take heart, fellow sinner. Here it is, he's righteous. David, have you ever seen anyone righteous like my servant David after he committed rape and murder? And with God, there is forgiveness. If he marked iniquities, who could stand? And so I just want you to take heart that here's Lot who does battle sin and fails. He is righteous by faith in our context. So our, our righteous souls, children of God, are they tormented? Are, you, are they tormented by all this junk and smut around us? At the perversion and the immorality that just breathes the air we're in? Or do we find it funny? You still have them, do you put them in your DVD players? Do you share it as jokes? Do we look at homosexuality and just say, what's the big deal? Just let it be? Do we say marriage doesn't matter that God ordained it between a male and a female? 
Do we say transgender that doesn't, all these things don't matter? Because it's what our society is preaching and pressing and squeezing in on us? It's breaking my heart as these false teachers are getting the church to accept it and even ordaining them in certain places. And then others move past it and they just accept it. You're, just, you're so numb to it, you just accept it because it doesn't bother you the American way. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I have a gay friend and he's just so sweet and monogamous. I don't have a problem with that. You mean to tell me that's wrong? And what is happening all around us, and I'll tell you this, the response is do not have hatred. The response is I love you and I will tell you the truth if you've come in here this morning and you're stuck in the sin of, of immorality, impurities, homosexuality, uh, adultery, anything you've come in here, I love you enough to tell you the Word of God says it's wrong. And it's, 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 it's because you're not right with God and you start looking for things that, that will fill your heart. And, and I love you enough to say what you're trying to fill it with is going to make you more empty. I've heard it again and again. It will make you more empty and God offers you in Jesus Christ to fill that heart and transform and change and lead you into righteousness. And so we love and we care that all of us lived in twistedness and brokenness and our thinking in a million different ways to manifest it. But God has come near to save sinners. Don't lie. Don't you dare lie and tell them that God is okay with it. That's a false teacher. Do not do that. Love them to a gospel that imputes righteousness, a God kind of righteousness so they can stand before Him, accept it on the last day, and be delivered from this godless nation instead of live in it and tell them it's okay and not be delivered on the last day because God knows how to judge the unrighteous. Oh, I pray for any soul in here that you would know the love of God in Christ Jesus who can set you free and make you righteous. What a gospel. Lot's righteous soul was tormented to see the lawless deeds in his land. He never made peace with it. It's tormenting his soul, and we call it entertainment today. It's tormenting this righteous man's soul, and we put it on the TV and laugh at it. What is wrong with us? We've grown insensitive to sexual sin. And it will do the same in our own lives if we let our thinking be dulled and accept it and journey in it. It will destroy your own life, I promise. If you stand on this, you're going to be called a prude and puritanical and old school. Man, just wear that like a hat. <laughs> That's a blessing. To be mocked and ridiculed. This smut has become normalized in our society through movies and songs and cultures and our heroes. And it's a demonic way. And how few Christians experience the torment of soul with what is all around us in this culture. It's not, I just lock myself up in my house and say the world's so bad. I love this world and I engage it with this gospel of truth. And I'm burdened and grieved by what I see all around me. The false teaching of our age is trying to take these edges off and make us be afraid to stand on absolute truth. And God is saying, you stand in my truth and I know how to deliver the righteous from this age and generation. In verse 10, and especially those who indulge in the flesh in its corrupt desires and they despise authority. That, that Greek uh, understanding for despise authority is where you began. It's the word for lordship. And they're, they're the people who don't want Christ to be Lord over their lives. They don't want His rule and they don't want His reign. And I'll come up with a million theologies so I don't have to have Christ as my King. And I pray that, that the sweetest sign of regeneration, of being saved, is I love the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Don't you love His rule over your life? I treasure it. I don't want to get away from it. I want to get under it. I want to get more under it. And so I pray that this is what the false teachers do. They don't want... Christ ruling and reigning. They just want to indulge their flesh and they will make up theologies 
that allow them to live like that. And I pray that if any of you have any of those theologies this morning, that the Spirit of God by His Word has just ripped it away from your mind and your heart and you're standing naked and bare before God right now and there's a, there's a righteous garment that's offered to the broken who will hold out their hands and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and He'll take your sins and separate them as far as the east is from the west and He'll wrap you in the righteous garment of Jesus Christ so that now you can have peace with God. We're going to come to the table this morning. And as we come, I just want you to look at a picture. <clears throat> I want you to look at the Son of God hanging on a cross as the bullseye of God's wrath. And I want you to look at it. And I want you to say that God the Father knows how to bring judgment upon the guilty. Even if it's imputed upon His own Son. All my stuff put upon His own Son God knows how to punish the guilty. Jesus Christ became guilty of every sin that we ever committed. And I'm telling you, look at that cross. He didn't spare His own Son. He knows how to, to judge the ungodly. Boom! Wrath. For all our failures, all our sins that have been laid upon the shoulders of the Son of God. He wouldn't spare His own Son. The haughtiness of false teachers and their followers say, God doesn't care about sin. And I want you to look at Jesus Christ this morning and you tell me if God cares about sin. His own son going, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Does he care about sin? And put Jesus Christ into a bloody sweat the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane as he looked at the cup that he'd have to drink. Does he care about sin? Would you stand before that cup without Christ? If it did that to the Son of God, will you sit here haughtily and say He won't judge me? He did it to His own Son. He's not going to judge you then? If you reject His Son and live any way you want in this godless society? Look, that God knows how to punish the unrighteous. God knows how to deal with sin. And then secondly, I want you to look at why would the Son of God be hanging on a cross? Why would He be crying out that the Father has separated Himself from Him, that He's bearing His wrath? Because He knows how to deliver the righteous, doesn't He? <laughs> the one who believes God's message and His gospel of Christ crucified. All who will come to Him He'll rescue from judgment. He knows how to rescue you. And he has to not rescue his son on a cross and punish him so he could rescue you and bring you safe into the eternal kingdom with God forever. Does he know how to deliver the righteous? <laughs> you better believe it, brother. You better believe it. Because he did not rescue his own son, but poured out his own wrath his own fiery wrath upon his own son. He can deliver all who will call upon the name of the Lord. So in truth, believe his word. What I just preached to you is unbelievable unless God said it. Believe his word. Follow after him in righteousness. Swim to it. Don't swim to get righteous. Swim because you are righteous. Swim. Be diligent to grow into godliness and these characteristics fight by the grace of God. <laughs> by the grace of God, I labor more than all of them. Not I, but the grace of God in me. Swim against all the lies and all that say it doesn't matter how you live. Have your sexual pleasures. Just do whatever you want. Swim against that. Swim against that grace gives us freedom to sin. Grace gives us power to quit sinning. Fight that. Swim against this culture. And so my friends and brothers and sisters, the table of Christ preaches that God knows how to deliver the righteous from the day of judgment that's going to come upon this world by the sacrifice of His own Son on Calvary Street. To God be the glory forever. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and we'll take communion together.
Father, I come before you and I thank you for this passage. Lord, I feel trembling in my own heart. God, I look at those uh, three examples, Lord, and they're not just some fables. These are things that happened in history, so much so a city doesn't even exist anymore. God, you know how to judge the ungodly. And I pray that puts a little fear in every heart in here because it says that, that if you should mark iniquities, O oh God, who could stand but with thee there is forgiveness that thou mayest be feared. The way that you could forgive us was by not forgiving your son so that you would be reverenced and treasured and feared. And so God, wake us up from this culture. Snap us out of it. Wake up to the lies and that our souls are no longer twi burning with what's going on around us and we're playing in it. God, wake up men, women, and children this morning that need to be waking up. They're drowsy. And the king is coming back soon. Lord, wake us up, I pray. I pray that your message would cause us all to say, I don't want to go down these lies. I want truth. I want to hold to it. I want to live according to it. I want to believe it. I want to hope in it. And so I pray for every heart here, the absolute truth that we have in this word, that that would be their sure hope and foundation because this word reveals that you know how to deliver the righteous. God, you know how to deliver those who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have made a way for remedy for us to be brought back to you from the fall in the garden to undo the works of the devil so that we could dwell safely with you again. God, I thank you for this glorious gospel. And I pray that every heart would be overwhelmed with its glory and its beauty and that our hearts would be more determined to reject the false teaching around us on a daily basis and to have koinonia with Jesus Christ, to be drawn near and loving and sipping and fellowshipping with him on a day-to-day -day basis to where all the desires of this world are growing strangely dim. God, give us grace to fight for that. Lord, we're prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love, so we cry to you. Do that work in our heart this morning for one reason, that you would get all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.